Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled Examining Environmental Contributors to Autism. Our moderator today is Cheryl Patton, Director of Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our presenter to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on this webinar is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Charles. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. And today it's my great pleasure uh, to present Dr. Uh, Valerie Hu, who is a professor of biochemistry and molecular medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, I've been uh, hoping and inviting Dr. Hu to present for many months now, and she's finally had some time to actually do an overview of some of her very important research on the influence of environmental factors on RORA, which stands for retinoic acid-related orphan receptor alpha, which is a nuclear receptor and a master reg regulator of many autism risk genes. She's specifically going to talk about the effects of exposure to atrazine, uh, which is an endocrine disrupting chemical, as we all know from the several pieces of research, including that of Tyrone Hayes, who's looked at uh, atrazine exposures to alterations in hormonal, sy hormonal systems of wildlife. And it's also one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. Uh, she's gonna to discuss today how alterations caused by environmental exposures to atrazine to, uh, on Turora as an EDC may be transmitted across generations as well. So welcome Dr. Hu and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Charles. Thank you for the invitation to present some of our ongoing research in this forum. Uh, it's my pleasure to do so. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is to describe how the work that we have um, done on autism, taking an integrative genomics approach, has led us to investigating uh, endocrine disrupting compounds as potential risk factors for autism. I also want to present a few findings on the impact of a specific EDC, as you men mentioned, atrazine on gene expression uh, in a neuronal cell model and then wind up by discussing how alterations caused by environmental exposures may be transmitted across generations. So to start our work with autism, I tried to pull together from the start all of the different contributing factors that we need to consider in order to fully understand the um, biological basis for this disorder. And the reason is so that if we understand the biology better, I think that we can better um, identify targets for therapeutics. So um, this so-called pyramid here summarizes all the different areas that we uh, wish and we have worked in in order to get an, uh, sort of a more integrative picture of all the different molecular uh, contributors to what we know as autism or the pathobiology of autism. At the ba very base of the pyramid, I put the phenotypes. These are the observables. But each layer of the pyramid, um, each higher level of the pyramid controls everything below it. So here we're looking at, in, within our studies, we look at first gene expression profiles, which I think is the most immediate um, determinant of phenotypes. And then above that, side by side, we look at both genetics and epigenetics, which um, are the hardware, which is the DNA sequences, and then the software, which is the mechanisms of gene regulation. And at the very top of this pyramid, I, I put the environmental factors, both the intrinsic factors, such as hormones or inflammations, and ex, uh, environmental factors, such as pesticides. And this top level is what we know very little about. Um, 
So overall, the goals of my lab are to identify genes and biological pathways or functions for targeted therapies and to understand how all of these factors together contribute to the pathobiology of autism. So today what I'm going to do is summarize some of our studies that uh, where we overlap DNA methylation with gene expression profiles and among the genes that we found to be dysregulated um, by DNA methylation was a gene called RORA um, and, and then further looking at the regulation of RORA, we found that sex hormones, both male and female hormones, have an effect on um, RORA expression in neuronal cells, but they have opposite effects with the male hormone suppressing it and female hormones uh, increasing the level of expression. So why the focus on RORA? Well, at the time of these studies, we learned that from the literature that RORA deficient mice um, studies on RORA deficient mice reveal that, first of all, RORA protects the brain against oxidative stress and inflammation, that RORA regulates circadian rhythm or the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, it was known that loss of RORA leads to defects in the cerebellum, as well as loss of Purkinje cells, which are very large cells found only in the cerebellum. In addition, male mice are more severely impacted by RORA deficiency both in the context of neurosteroid biosynthesis in the cerebellum, as well as survival of Purkinje cells, with the male mice more affected than the females. And although RORA deficiency in mice have been studied usually to learn more about ataxia and hypotonia, there are some studies from a Canadian group that reported on the preservative behaviors and deficits in spatial discrimination learning in these RORA deficient mice. And this is really what piqued my attention and our focus on RORA. So how does it relate to ASD? First of all, it's known from studies, other studies, that um, neuroinflammation and oxidative stress are hallmarks of the um, autistic brain from postmortem studies. It's also been widely reported that sleep problems are often associated with autism. And that Purkinje cell deficiency is one of the earliest noticed and most consistent brain abnormality reported in autism. And as is generally known, males are much more affected by autism than females. So for all of these reasons, we were really particularly interested in learning more about the role of RORA um, in connection with ASD. So these are the new findings from our lab um, linking RORA to autism. First of all, we learned that RORA expression is reduced in both peripheral cells, that is lymphoblastoid cells derived from blood lymphocytes, as well as brain tissues from a subgroup of individuals with ASD. Then pursuing the regulation of this gene further, we found that there was increased methylation at the RORA promoter, which was associated with the decreased expression in the lymphoblastoid cells from siblings with ASD, but not from their control siblings. We also found that RORA was oppositely regulated by male and female sex hormones in a manner suggesting potential involvement in the sex bias in ASD. And our recent paper um, demonstrated that there was reduced expression of RORA coupled with this higher correlation with expression levels of RORA's target genes, the transcriptional targets of RORA in the male brain. And this is in both mice and humans, which suggested that RORA deficiency may have a greater impact on males than on females, since there was a higher correlation between RORA expression and the expression of its targets. But very importantly, we also found that RORA is a master regulator of many autism genes. As Charles pointed out before, RORA is a nuclear hormone receptor, which acts as a transcriptional modulator. So we wanted to know what genes are actually regulated by RORA. And, um, and so what we did was a uh, genome-wide target analysis using chip-on-chip -chip, uh, methodology. And what we found was that there were over 2,500 potential target genes of RORA, and these genes were highly enriched for autism candidate genes, which had functions such as neurogenesis, synaptic transmission and plasticity, axonogenesis, cognition, learning, and memory. Then we did a, a validation of half a dozen of these target genes using functional knockdown methodologies as well as chip 
qPCR analyses and we validated all of the selected targets um, as as uh, all of the selected genes as Aurora, as transcriptional targets of Aurora. and these genes are shown below here on the slide. One of the important genes is a 2 bp one also known as RBFOX1 in humans, uh, which is a neuron-specific splicing factor, and it's involved in synaptic transmission, neuronal excitation, and also associated with developmental delay. Um, we found that there were two enzymes, aromatase and the HSD17B10, both of which are involved in the conversion of testosterone to estradiol, to estrogen. And then there were other genes like IPPR1 um, associated with the synaptogenesis, neural ligand associated with um, adhesion, synaptic remodeling, et cetera, and, and a kinase. But you can see from this, this slide here that not only the cellular processes um, affected by these genes are relevant to autism, but also the higher level functions such as social cognition, language impairment, uh, spatial memory, repetitive behaviors, and learning, mood disorders. So uh, we feel that Aurora is a very significant gene in terms of mediating some of the pathobiology that's, that's been reported in autism. By uh, RNA-seq, we also validated another 500 more transcriptional targets of Aurora. But the bottom line here is that we feel that any mechanism, whether it's genetic or epigenetic or environmental, any mechanism that disrupts Aurora expression may increase risk for, for autism by dysregulating all of the downstream genes that are regulated by Aurora. <clears throat> so now to get to the environmental uh, component. Um, the impact of sex hormones on Aurora expression suggested to us that Aurora may be dysregulated by endocrine disrupting chemicals. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are compounds that either mimic endogenous hormones or antagonize their actions, their metabolism, or transport, thus interfering with normal hormonal activity and homeostasis. So we wanted to know whether or not we could use Aurora as like a canary in a coal mine. Is it a target for gene environment interactions involving the endocrine disruptors that may increase risk for autism? So this slide is a, uh, shows a very short list of examples of endocrine disruptors. Among them are chemicals like atrazine, which is commonly used in herbicides, bisphenol A, a component of plastics, phthalates found in soft toys, flooring materials, and cosmetics, just everyday products. And then there are um, PCBs, which are used in coolants, and PBDEs, flame retardants. Now, these two are long-lived um, endocrine disruptors, and even though they have been banned from manufacture and use uh, now in this country, they persist for a very long time. Uh, there are some pharmaceuticals, such as valproic acid, a drug for epilepsy and bipolar disorder, that are also in the category of endocrine disruptors. And as I said earlier, major concerns regarding these EDC exposures are the effects of cumulative exposures from the persistent ones, such as the PCBs and PBDEs, um, as well as epigenetic changes, particularly when they occur in germline cells or sperm and egg cells, which may be propagated transgenerationally. So to get to our studies on atrazine, as I said, it's a common herbicide. The EPA um, gives as a safe level for a 90-day average of um, 37.5 ppb parts per billion, which translates to 175 nanomolar in community water systems. This compound is easily absorbed by the gut, lungs, or skin, and studies, published studies, particularly uh, Tyrone Hayes and others, um, they've reported the effects of atrazine on sexual differentiation in wildlife. And on the right here, you see a list of um, different herbicides that contain atrazine as this active component. So I found this, this uh, figure from a paper published in 2009 very interesting. So what you see in this sort of the gray shaded um, area is the level of atrazine that was measured um, by month of the year um, in surface water across different areas of the country. And then um, in parallel, they also documented the, um, the number of congenital birth defects in the same regions. 
And it's interesting to see that the birth defect rates sort of mimic or parallel the rise and fall of the atrazine concentrations. But this is basically a correlative study. So it doesn't really say that there's any cause and effect. It doesn't prove cause and effect between atrazine exposure and the birth defects. So much more work needs to be done at the basic level. So what we were interested in doing is determining the effects of, um, of atrazine on the expression of RORA in a neuronal cell model. And here we're showing um, a dose response uh, relative to the vehicle, which is DMSO. So at different levels of atrazine concentration, we observe a biphasic response where um, there is an increase, a sharp increase at 0 0.1 nanomolar of atrazine, uh, followed by a decrease at higher levels, like at 10 in 100 nanomolar. So we took the um, two, two levels of atrazine, one that increases the level of aurora and one that decreases, so 0.1 and 10 nanomolar of atrazine, and we did a large scale gene expression study on an array of, um, this is the human transcriptome array from Affymetrix. And what we found at the two different concentrations, each um, dysregulated or changed the expression of about a thousand genes. And among them, there were about 400 genes that overlap between um, the two concentrations of atrazine. And that's shown in the middle there. Um, and if we looked at the pathways that are affected and the neuronal functions, that are associated with these 400 genes um, that overlap between the two exposures, we find that the pathways include axon guidance, glutamate receptor signaling, and, and efferin receptor signaling, all of which will affect neuronal functions. And on the right, you see functions such as development, growth, morphology, guidance of neurons, neurotogenesis, synaptic development, and transmission, all of which are implicated. Um, in the pathobiology of autism. Now, in the very middle of this Venn diagram, we see 22 genes, and these genes are specifically ROAR target genes um, that overlap between um, the two concentrations in terms of differential expression. And here we find um, migration in terms of associated functions, migration and cell death of granule cells in the cerebellum, brain formation, which is a generic um, description, seizure disorder, mental retardation, retardation, and movement disorders. The latter three do associate with certain forms of autism, particularly the more severe forms. Okay, so in summary, our exploratory studies suggest that this regulation of RORA expression by EDC, such as atrazine, is a potential mechanism for gene environment interactions that may increase risk for ABC, ASD, by inducing a domino effect leading to the deregulation of transcriptional targets of RORA, as well as many other genes that may contribute to the neuropathology of ASD. But what we haven't addressed so far are the, um, are the long-term effects of EDC exposures, especially in vivo. And um, it would also be interesting to know how the impact of, of environmental agents may, might be transmitted across generations. So to address those questions, I'd like to call your attention to a recently published study by another group, Michael Skinner, Skinner's group. This was published um, in September of this year on atrazine-induced epigenetic trans transgenerational inheritance of disease, lean phenotype, et cetera. Particularly, I'm interested in the sperm epimutation epi biomarkers. So just in brief, the study involved treatment of female rats, pregnant rats with atrazine for just six or seven days. These are, this is the F0 um, generation. And then male and female offspring from subsequent and different litters of, expo of the exposed F0 females were bred through three generations um, without any further exposure to atrazine. So what they looked at were various pathologies and phenotypes, and this shown here on the slide, as well as DNA methylation in the sperm from the male offspring in the generations F1, F2, and F3. So I'm going to skip the, the phenotypic results and jump over to the um, epigenetic results, and where we're looking at the numbers of DMRs, uh, differentially methylated regions, in the F1, F2, and F3 generations. And the display is um, they're looking at DMRs that that are that cover genes 
that have the various functions or categories that you see at the very bottom on the x-axis. And what you can see from the heights of the bars and, and the different shaded bars is that um, with each subsequent generation from F1 to F3, there's an increased number of DMRs that associate with a particular um, gene category. Um, so, but also shown here is a Venn diagram that looks at the overlap between the DMRs between the, the three different generations. And this actually raises more questions in that if one's thinking about transgenerational inheritance, one usually you might think that whatever gene is differentially methylated in F1 might be transmitted through F2 and F3. And this is not the case here. So the authors conclude that there must be different mechanisms that work here to induce the DMRs. And so that raises you know, another um, area for study. So the take home messages that I wanna point out are that neurodevelopmental disorders such as ASD have complex etiologies involving genetic susceptibilities in combination with environmental risk factors or triggers. Atrazine, which is an EDC, may increase risk for ASD through dysregulation of LORA, which we've identified as a master regulator gene associated with the pathobiology of ASD, as well as many other genes involved in neural developmental processes. From this last study that, I, that was published uh, by Skinner's group, atrazine has also been shown in a rat model to induce epigenetic changes in sperm that are manifested through several generations through F3, suggesting, su suggesting a way in which um, endocrine disruptors might have a transgenerational effect that can be carried out through several generations. Okay, so I think that the future studies, there's a lot more to be done and we're just, you know, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Other studies should address how exposures at critical periods of early development cause neurodevelopmental changes that manifest at a later time period we need to know how the effects of environmental exposures are transmitted across generations. Uh, we need to know something about the differential susceptibility of males and females to specific environmental ex exposure. And this is often the case, it's often seen, and this may reveal something about the sex bias in various neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. We need to know how exposure to chemical mixtures in a real world scenario may elicit different effects uh, then exposure to a single uh, chemical, which is often used in studies such as ours. Um, and we need to know how chemical exposures and social or psychological stressors may interact to increase or decrease the impact on human development and health. So I'd like to close by acknowledging the young students in my lab, graduate students have done the work, different aspects of the work, um, and they're listed here as well as um, support from the NIEHS, our ongoing support from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the NIMH, Autism Speaks, Simons Foundation, and McCormick's Genomic Center here at GW. And then finally, um, these are the references of the papers that I really glossed over um, in this short talk here. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for that really uh, fascinating presentation. And I think this research is so incredibly important. I, uh, I want to take the prerogative of a facilitator to ask you a, a couple of questions right off the bat. And one is, uh, uh, how do you see your research having any kind of impact on the treatment of uh, the disorders uh, being experienced by people with aut autism on the autism spectrum? Do you see some kind of... Uh, Interaction well, I, as I said, you know, I think the more we understand of, about the biology of autism, the more we're able to um, design targeted ter therapies to address the biological deficits. Mm -hmm. and, and autism is an extremely heterogeneous disorder. And so in order to, to kind of um, break down this heterogeneity, we've divided the, um, the population into phenotypic subgroups and then analyzed the biological, um, we've, for example, gene expression studies, we've done that on different subgroups of autism to try to understand what specific pathways are affected in this group or that group. 
and which of these pathways might be specific targets for this particular subgroup of individuals. So that's the way we'd like to head. With respect to the environmental studies that we're doing, the first step is prevention. In other words, if we know, if we can demonstrate that certain chemicals can be uh, risk factors of autism, this will add to the argument against restricting the use or banning such chemicals altogether. Um, so uh, is, is that, so yeah, that's what that's I would have to helpful. say about that. That's very helpful. Uh -huh. I think, you know, there's been a real struggle to try to get atrazine uh, more tightly re regulated, if not out and out banned. And my other question has to do with some research going on in the laboratory of Pat Hunt, uh, uh, specifically a re young researcher named Tegan Horan, that is looking at um, the, ex uh, the exposures, re-exposures to a particular chemical, and, and they were looking at a synthetic estrogen to generation mm -hmm. three, uh, uh, who uh, F3 is experiencing some of the epigenic effects uh, of exposures to F0, but re-exposure to F3 had a, a much profounder effect. And in this case, uh -huh. was, uh, she was looking at sperm cells, germ cells, and the sperm and, uh, resulted in complete sterility. Do you think this might be true of atrazine that people, this is hypothetical, of course, but people that were, mm -hmm. uh, whose grandparents were somehow, grandmother was exposed to atrazine, that they have something on the autism spectrum disorder, and F3, uh, re-exposed to that same chemical, whether it's atrazine or another endocrine disruptor dealing with a neurological right. development, it might have a more profound effect. It's definitely possible, and a, a study um, that, that was recently published on mater grand maternal smoke, smoking um, has, has basically shown that where that, you know, the effects on phenotype can skip a generation or two and then affect the great, the grandchildren or the great grandchildren. So certainly that's definitely, you know, that's a possibility. Hmm. Interesting stuff. But okay. we need to understand why. Yes. You see? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. uh, well, we have a question from uh, uh, Ted Shetler who's asking uh, about valproic acid and what are the endocrine disrupting properties of that, that uh, pharmaceutical? Well, it's known to affect epigenetics. Um, I think it's an HDAC inhibitor. And I, you know, I'm saying I think because I, I know it, it, it affects the HDAC and I, I think it's an inhibitor. So, um, you know, it's a well-known one. And so then, you know, begs the question, um, when is it safe, you know, and when is it not safe uh, to be used? And, you know, I, I know that Jill Escher yeah. from the Escher Foundation mm -hmm. has been a very strong proponent of studies such as this to, to kind of look at um, pharmaceuticals that, that may impact um, neurodevelopmental disorders when given to pregnant women. And um, I don't know, Jill, are you on the phone here? I don't know if she's there. She said she was going to tune in. But, you know, that's just an example. And I don't really want to get too much into the pharmaceuticals right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Without yeah. direct specific evidence. Yeah. And another we, question, It's one of the ones that we're interested in, too. It's, it's a good example of, a, of the, the concern yeah. we should have more concern about pharmaceuticals and, and they're being used to give into Right, the, right. I mean, there, that's just one. You know, there are other studies about... Um, such as phthalates as well. There's a published study on um, phthalate exposure on um, sperm epigenetics, and this was uh, published recently by Russ Hauser's group. Yes, yes, we hope to have Dr. Hauser mm -hmm. on. on Urina group. Yeah, they yeah. correlated urinate, urinary phthalates with um, sperm epigenetic changes. Yes, very, very troubling. Uh, we have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorraine Hackett is asking about uh, uh, the the pervasiveness of PFAS chemicals, uh, the, the kind of in the news now is everybody's realizing their PFAS chemicals are showing up in everybody's water supply, and it's uh -huh. not to be more damaging than people have thought. Uh, but the, the attention, of course, has been on PFO and PFAS, uh, which uh, these chemicals are many of them are not tested for their safety, but many that have been are considered EDCs. Uh, will you be doing any research on these particular chemicals and neurological development? Well, you know, we're we're trying to use Rora as a screen. So what we're doing is just kind of, like I said, using it as a canary in a coal mine so that we can screen various chemicals. That's not to say that every single EDC is going to have an impact on Rora expression. Yeah. 
But, um, you know, I think that all of these chemicals need to be studied for their biological effects, not not merely toxicological effects, because I think that's how um, the so-called safe levels of various compounds are established by toxicology studies. But we need to go beyond that and we need to get to lower levels because these are endocrine disruptors, which means they interfere with hormonal signaling, hormonal processes, which function in the body at much lower levels than are toxic. In other words, at the nanomolar and even sub-nanomolar levels, as we've shown for atrazine, um, having biological effects at the nanomolar, sub-nanomolar levels. So I think that um, all future studies need to look specifically at the very low levels, especially for the endocrine disruptors, because I think that's where you're likely to find um, effects on on um, on processes or, or disorders that are not obvious. I mean, if they don't have any, you know, they don't hit you over the head with a sledgehammer, but they may induce changes that are only manifested years after that's a, um, the end. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a really overlooked phenomenon, I think. Of some of the because, effects. for example, that study that I showed, uh, that example of the atrazine correlation between atrazine in surface waters and birth defects, con it's congenital birth defects, so that's obvious right at birth, okay? And if it can have that kind of um, association or uh, correlation only of the very obvious birth defects, we don't know anything about what happens um, down the road. That's right. You know, with yeah. respect to developmental disorders. Okay. Right? Something you don't see at birth. You do not see that. So a lot of things could be missed if you're only looking at birth defects or what's what's what the obvious out symptom might be or adverse effect. If you only look for the very obvious stuff, you're going to miss a lot of things that can show up. Well, that's, you know, that was just easy to see, right? The congenital yeah. birth defects. Yeah. Okay. Another question it says uh, from Christine Klaas asking, uh, Aurora, as you mentioned, interacts with oxidative stress response. Are your cell culture experience, experiments conducted at physiological oxygen or room air oxygen concentrations? It, it, well, in the incubator. So it's not, they're not stressed. Okay. Okay. They're not undergoing oxidative stress. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So but, it, but, Rora, but Rora is a gene that protects against oxidative stress. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we're a little bit over our time, but I have okay. to say that I think each of your slides could have been a presentation in and of itself. So Well, that's why I joined the references, because I could say only one line for each of those, like giving you the take-home message yeah. for these different studies. And if anybody's interested more in the details of the studies that I mentioned in passing, these are the references. Well, that's extremely generous of you, and I'm, I'm looking forward to digging in, and I hope that we can invite you again to speak a, a few months from now when some of your results are... Well, I would love to do it once, you know, once our, our um, studies are more firmed up and then we're able to publish them. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant work and incredibly okay. important. Uh, Maria, do you want to formally close this, uh, pre this webinar? Yes, thank you, Cheryl. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHE website later today, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHE's next partnership call, hosted by the CHE Alaska Partnership, will take place tomorrow, December 13th, and is titled Community-Based Participatory Research on St. Lawrence Island, How Yupik Residents Are Helping to Identify Persistent Pollutants in Their Communities. You can RSVP through CHE's website, healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Valerie Hu, for taking the time to present today and Cheryl for her excellent moderation. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.